Washington Journal continues. Max Boot is at our table this morning. He's a senior fellow on, for the Council on Foreign Relations, National Security Studies there, and al also the author of this new book, The Corrosion of Conservatism, Why I Left the Right. So Max Boot, you write, I left the right. So what does that make you? That makes me somebody who is politically homeless. I'm a political independent. I am not a Democrat because I disagree with Democrats on a lot of things, but I couldn't be a Republican after the Republican Party was transformed into a wholly owned uh, uh, subsidiary of the Trump Organization. And the way that uh, the Republican Party has assaulted human decency and everything that I believe uh, to be the core tenets, of, or what should be the core tenets of American conservatism, has just been appalling to me. And I could not be part of this. I mean, I have certainly have friends who remain Republicans and who are fighting to reclaim uh, the good name of the Republican Party. But I just want to make clear that all these awful, egregious things that Trump does every single day, not in my name. I don't want to be associated with it. I don't want to be a Republican after a lifetime as a Republican and as a conservative writer and activist. When did you make that decision? I re-registered as an independent the day after the last election, the day after the Donald Trump won, which I think was one of the saddest days in American history. You write in the book, it would be nice to think that Donald Trump is an anomaly who came out of nowhere to take over the an otherwise sand and sober movement. But it just isn't so. Trump is a unique force in American politics, but in many ways he is merely the culmination of the right's ruin rather than its cause. Upon closer examination, it's obvious that the whole history of modern conservatism is permeated with racism, extremism, cons conspiracy mongering, ignorance, isolationism, and no nothingism. Even those who were not guilty of those sins too often ignored them in the name of unity on the right. Well, I was one of those who ignored those sins for a long time. I mean, I was a movement conservative since my days as a conservative columnist at the University of California at Berkeley in the late 80s, early 90s. I worked at major conservative publications like the Wall Street Journal editorial page. I wrote for commentary, the Weekly Standard. I was a foreign policy advisor to three Republican presidential candidates, and I was pretty blind uh, to the way that the conservative movement and, and, and the Republican Party were transforming themselves. I mean, and there was always this dark underside to conservatism, the, the racism, the xenophobia, isolationism, protectionism, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, but now it's moved from the fringes into the center of the movement, and I was, you know, willfully blind while this was happening with the rise of Fox News since 1996, Sarah Palin, the Tea Party, all these trends which culminated in the election of Donald Trump, and it was finally the election of Trump that made me sit up and say, wait a second, I, this is not something I can be part of, and I'm kind of kicking myself for not having that realization sooner. Is it the fault of the, the media solely? Where do you point the finger at this becoming fringe, undertones, and then getting to the main, as you say, the main part, the main, the central part of, of the conservative party? Well, I, I put the blame where, where it belongs on, on the people in the Republican Party who are embracing and espousing these ideas. I mean, it's truly shocking to me that Donald Trump came along and took over the Republican Party, but on, on reflection, maybe it shouldn't be so shocking. Uh, because I, in some ways I think it's people like John McCain and Mitt Romney whose campaigns I advise and who, who are good people uh, uh, and, and moderates and, and you know, very much uh, uh, in, in congruent with my own thinking. In some ways I think for a lot of Republicans they were the outliers because they were too moderate. They did not engage in, 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 in this kind of crude bashing of liberals that Donald Trump does every single day. Uh, they didn't pander to prejudice and bigotry. They didn't attack our allies. They didn't uh, traffic in protectionism. And it turns out that there was a much larger constituency uh, for all those uh, views out there uh, than I had realized. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, the Republican Party is, is, is not what I thought it was. You also write, the death of the Never Trump movement was probably inevitable. It never had a leader or a proactive vision. It turns out that shared dislike for Donald Trump does not a political cause make. The kind of people who are contrarian enough to stand up to their own party's nominee were perhaps not likely to agree on anything. Right, but I was talking about the, uh, the 2016 primaries uh, where you know various other candidates talked about being never Trump, including Marco Rubio, whose campaign I worked on, uh, but ultimately, they could never unite against Trump. And, and one of the most dismaying things that's happened in American politics in my lifetime is to see people like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Rand Paul and Rick Perry and so many others 
who castigated Trump in the strongest terms, who said that he was unfit, who said he was a cancer on our country, or in the case of Lindsey Graham, who said he was a kook, are now embracing that cancer. They're embracing that kook. I mean, I don't understand how you can possibly do that. This is not politics as normal. This is not, well, you know, I disagree with him on a few issues. They were saying he was unfit to be president, and guess what? He is unfit to be president. He proves it every single day. Is there a Republican that could beat him in 2020? That's very doubtful. I mean, Donald Trump is polling 80 to 90 percent among Republicans, which to me is a terrible indictment of the, of the modern Republican Party. I would hope, nevertheless, there would be a primary challenger because, you know, I think there is some dissatisfaction in places like New Hampshire, and it's possible that somebody like John Kasich or Jeff Flake could do surprisingly well. I mean, they're not going to win the nomination, but they could at least embarrass Trump and hurt him and perhaps uh, you know, cause him to, to lose in November, which is the effect of previous insurgencies that we've seen. For example, Pat Buchanan running against uh, George H.W. Bush in 1992, or uh, Ted Kennedy against Jimmy Carter in 1980, and there's, there's a bunch of examples you can point to. So I think it's a worthwhile battle to undertake for a principled conservative, but certainly given the, what we know now, barring some radical shift in, in the political climate, for example, a blockbuster report from Robert Mueller, which could which could change things, maybe force Trump out of office, unlikely, but not impossible. But barring that, I think, you know, whoever runs against them is not going to win. But I think it's nevertheless a race worth doing for, to, to affirm uh, conservative principles and to keep that, fl that, that flame alive for future generations. So you don't think a challenger could win in, in the primary, get the nomination. So no. would you rather have a Democrat than President Trump? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, I voted for Hillary Clinton in... in in 2016, first time I voted for a Democrat in my life, and I will vote for a Democrat unless there's a credible third-party candidate. I mean, I'm certainly not going to vote for Donald Trump. I'm open to alternatives. I would hope the Democrats would nominate somebody who is pretty centrist. I mean, I would love it if they would nominate somebody like Michael Bloomberg, uh, and I would not be so happy if they nominate somebody like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, somebody to the far left of the party. I have vast disagreements with the Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, but nevertheless, I would vote for them over Donald Trump uh, because I don't view them as a threat to American democracy. I don't think that they are corrupt. I think they are well-intentioned people with whom I have deep policy disagreements. But, but the problem with Donald Trump goes beyond policy disagreements. I, I truly think he is unfit to be president. He's undermining our democracy. He is the most uh, dishonest uh, uh, president we've ever had in our history. We'll see what our callers have to say. We'll take their questions and comments, and, and maybe you can lay out where you think the president is unfit, what he does, as you say, each and every sure. day. Let's talk to Kevin, who's in Chicago, a Democrat. Hi, Kevin. Uh, good morning, Mr. Boot. It is so nice to see a conservative with conscience. I followed you for years, and usually annoyed at reading your stuff, of course, but it was always thoughtful. The problem right now is the Republican Party. I've been saying this since the uh, primaries, <clears throat> and this goes back to Palin, really, the threat to Trump is through Palin and the real American things. It's always been about race. You knew that. The Republican Party knew that. It's race, it's class, it's gender. These are the things that animate them. And <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with conservatism in America. Conservatism is needed. Conservatism is good. There's something wrong with the Republican Party. And you please speak to the influence of Fox and right-wing media, particularly talk radio. Well, I, you know, I agree with the caller when, when he says that there is nothing wrong with conservatism, but there is a lot wrong with the Republican Party. I think that's exactly right, because the Republican Party has ceased to be a conservative party. It's really become a white nationalist party, and a lot of that has to do, I think, with the influence of Fox News and the right-wing media. And there's nothing wrong with conservative media. You know, I spent a lot of years writing uh, for alternative conservative publications. Uh, the problem is, uh, with the rise of Fox, it's, they're not just offering a different opinion, they're offering alternative facts, they're offering alternative reality, which is not the same as normal mainstream reality as ordinary people understand it. They are pushing this far-right uh, nationalist propaganda line, uh, and they don't care about reality, they don't care about decency, they are basically, uh, they have become a propaganda arm of the Trump White House, but it's a very complex relationship because 
you know, not only is Fox influenced by Trump, but Trump is also influenced by Fox because he watches Fox all the time. And this is a very dangerous and unprecedented nexus. And I'm really afraid of the, of the consequences of, of Fox News Channel uh, because, you know, they have millions of viewers and they are living in this isolated bubble uh, in where they don't believe the same facts that normal people who, who read normal mainstream news sources believe. And Donald Trump encourages that because he says, you know, uh, the facts are not the facts. He says, believe me, not what you see or, or read. And a lot of people do, in fact, uh, you know, believe what, what Trump tells them, what Sean Hannity, what Tucker Carlson and others tell them. And that is, you know, unprecedented and very dangerous uh, that we don't have a commonly agreed upon set of facts. I think that is very harmful uh, to the long term health of our democracy. Well, how do you respond to people who say they voted for President Trump, not because of the reasons that you said, but because they were wanted to send a message to Washington. It's that they hate Washington, D.C. and how it operates. And they wanted somebody like Donald Trump to shake it up. Well, the problem with, with that is that, you know, Donald Trump said that he would drain the swamp, but instead he's filling up the swamp. I mean, he is actually more corrupt and dishonest than anybody that he denounced. I mean, if you just read, for example, uh, the, the blockbuster expose that the New York Times had accusing him of massive tax fraud, of defrauding the government of hundreds of millions of dollars, and we didn't know the details of all that when he ran, but we knew enough. I mean, we certainly knew about his chronic dishonesty. I mean, this is somebody who lies eight times a day on average, according to the Washington Post. He was doing that during the campaign. We knew that. We knew about his shady business practices. We knew about his corporate bankruptcies. We knew about the way that he trafficked in bigotry and, and prejudice. And we also knew that he was deeply complicit in uh, in, in the way that government works, because he is somebody who had given lots of money to politicians of both parties, including the Democrats, uh, that he now denounces. So I don't understand how anybody could have imagined that this quintessential swamp dweller would actually drain the swamp. I mean, that to me beggared belief, and, and it has in fact been shown to be completely false because he's running the most corrupt administration in our history right now. Derek, who's in Lakeland, Minnesota, independent. Derek, good morning. Question or comment here? Yes, Greta. Good morning, America. Good morning, C-SPAN. Um, I just want your viewers to know that uh, some of these words that uh, Max is using is just so not, uh, it's not even ethical speech. It's not even obviously very kind speech. But this to your viewers, and as an independent, you should know that the Council on Foreign Affairs is out for themselves. They are a big part of the deep state, and they are a big part of the State Department and our military. And what he's saying is he, as a Republican, voted for Hillary Clinton. That's a first tell. Second tell is I have never seen so many people from the Council of Foreign Relations on MSNBC, CNN. He won't even go on Fox because he gets beat up so bad because this is purely disinformation because of the power structure. And these people, you're looking at them. That's Max. He's on that team, and that team's about power and controlling our government outside of our electoral system. Okay, let's take his point. Well, I don't believe that the caller is independent because he is obviously uh, a, a strong Trump supporter who is propagating some of these crazy conspiracy theories that the president traffics in. The Council on Foreign Relations has no relation to the State Department. Uh, we're not part of any conspiracy. We've been an independent organization since the 1920s, bipartisan, nonpartisan, whose only goal is to promote public understanding of foreign policy. And people who work at the council have many different views on the issues. There is no one party line. Uh, so, you know, and sadly, this is typical of the way that politics is conducted in America today, especially by the Trumpian right, where they engage in conspiracy mongering and ad hominem insults uh, to try to denigrate people who disagree with them. Uh, you know, I would hope that they would try to engage more on the issues. What about the argument, though, that people in Washington who make their living off of how everything operates here want to keep it the status quo. So if it wasn't President Trump, are you arguing we need to go back to and, and retain these institutions and the bureaucracy and the how everything operates here? Well, I think there are certainly problems in Washington. I'm not going to be a defender of everything that happens in Washington. There's a lot of bureaucratic waste and there's a lot of uh, feather bedding. There's a lot of uh, self-interest seeking. There's no question about it. But Donald Trump is making the situation far worse, not far better. And let me speak up for the deep state. I mean, this is this crazy term that has been imported into American politics from places like Turkey and Egypt to denigrate 
the bureaucracy of the United States government. In, to my mind, uh, the people in, in, in the U.S. government who are the, the civil servants who are faithfully carrying out their duties and trying to uphold the rule of law despite the pressure from Donald Trump to break the law, these people are heroes. Uh, they are not part of a deep state. They are part of one of the branches of the U.S. government that, who are upholding their duties to the Constitution. And I'm thinking in particular of people like Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense. I mean, thank goodness they are there to protect us from the President of the United States. They are doing their job, which is to uh, protect the Constitution, protect our country. And the biggest threat to the Constitution in our country right now, sadly, comes from the President of the United States. Uh, Tommy in Tennessee, Independent. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Boot, Ms. Greta. Uh, I, as a libertarian, I would like to invite you, sir, to the Libertarian Party because mm -hmm. we represent the best of uh, the Democratic Party and the best of the Republican Party. I, uh, as a libertarian, I am against fascism. Uh, when you are combining big business with big government, you have fascism. And that doesn't matter what's on the left side of the aisle or the right side of the aisle. And I was wondering if uh, perhaps... Uh, we could get a, uh, a a wealthy family to back a libertarian ticket, or possibly a a, a co-ticket with, a, say, a Mr. Biden or Mr. Kasich, together as a ticket. I wonder how effective that would be in the 2020 race. Thank you so much, and have a blessed day. Okay, Tommy. Well, I think a unity ticket between a high-profile Democrat and Republican like Biden and Kasich would actually be a great idea. I don't know that the Libertarian Party is the right platform because, sadly, the, the Libertarian Party has never really taken off because it's very hard for a third party in America. I do hope uh, that if the Republicans keep drifting to the right and, and Democrats to the left, which seems to be the current trend, I do hope that we might see a more centrist candidate emerge, not necessarily even with a party affiliation, but just as an independent in the way that uh, Macron emer emerged in, in France to become a centrist candidate who won the French presidency. I would love to see somebody like that emerge in the United States. I don't know who that would be, but I think it would be very healthy for our democracy because you know, the number of Democrats and Republicans uh, is smaller than the number of independent voters. And there's a lot of people who are not being represented in the current system, including me. And, you know, it would be great if there was a, a, a movement or, or, or a party that was giving voice to the center of the political spectrum, which I think is increasingly neglected by both parties. You write in The Corrosion of Conservatism, if the modern history of conservatism is any guide, Trump's successors might actually be worse than he is. If Trump has, has a saving grace, it is that he is so ignorant and impetuous. A future Trump might be smarter and more disciplined and thus more dangerous. That's a frightening thought, given how much damage even the scattershot Trump has done. Well, that's right, and that's a commentary on, on what I note in the book, which is that the Republican Party keeps going to the right, and the people who used to be considered at the right-wing fringe a generation ago a generation later become known as rhinos. I mean, at one time, you know, Ronald Reagan, for example, was thought of as being a far right winger, and yet he is much, much more liberal than anybody associated with Trump. I mean, Donald, uh, Ronald Reagan was somebody who favored a ban on assault weapons in 1994. He favored immigration. He gave an amnesty to undocumented immigrants. I mean, can you imagine Donald Trump doing that? So if this trajectory holds, I'm really frightened about who will succeed Donald Trump and the Republican Party. What attracted you to conservatism? Why did you become a Republican? That has a lot to do with my life story because I came here in 1976 with my family as refugees from the Soviet Union. And like a lot of people fleeing communist countries, I was naturally drawn to the most anti-communist party uh, in, in the American political system. And that was, of course, the Republican Party. And so imagine my shock today uh, when I see that a fan of Vladimir Putin is sitting in the White House. I mean, a lot of the reason why I became a Republican in the first place was because in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan called out the evil empire. He stood up for American values, for democracy, for freedom. He unapologetically championed uh, the, the causes that the United States stands for. And that, and you know, I loved Reagan's open, inclusive uh, version of conservatism, sunny and optimistic, which is very, very different from the dour, pessimistic, conspiracy-mongering uh, 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 rhetoric of Donald Trump, who, who divides Americans instead of bringing them together in the way that Ronald Reagan did. Myra in uh, New York, a Democrat. You're next here for Max Boot. Go ahead. Hello, Max. Uh, I meant Mr. Boot. I used to live in New Jersey, and I remember a Republican I voted for all the time. Her name was Milson Fenwick. In fact, uh, you can look her up in the archives of C-SPAN. And 
what I realized then, because she went against Frank Lautenberg, mm -hmm. he had money. I think that's the problem with the parties, is the money gets involved. And she was so good. I, I just couldn't understand how she didn't get in. And Lautenberg had money, that's all. I think that both parties need to get out of the money. I, I just wanted to know what you thought. Well, I don't know that it's about money. Millicent Fenwick was part of an endangered species of liberal Republicans who used to be very common in the 60s and 70s, the so-called Rockefeller Republicans, after Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York. Uh, there were a lot of them out there, and sadly they have disappeared. And that's part of the movement that I'm talking about, where the Republican Party has gone further and further to the right, where it's not possible to have a centrist liberal uh, office holder in the Republican Party anymore. They essentially got squeezed out. They were challenged by conservative activists on one side and then defeated by Democrats on the other, and that's a branch of the Republican Party that I think is in desperate need of revival. There are a few, you know, there are a few uh, centrist Republicans left in, in, in blue states like Governor Larry Hogan in Maryland or Charlie Baker in Massachusetts or John Kasich in, in Ohio, but very, very few, and I think we need more of those. That is a, you know, as a counterbalance to the far-right uh, sentiments that Donald Trump channels. Vinny in Munford, Tennessee, Republican. Good morning. Uh, I have a couple comments and then a quick question. Uh, when I see uh, Mr. Boot on television and so forth, it seems to me that he, he doesn't just present his argument as disagreeing with the president. He actually comes across as if he despises President Trump. And, and I, I don't quite understand that. I, I look at our economy. It's humming along. We're safe as a country. We have a solid 5-4 conservative Supreme Court. Had Hillary been elected, it could have been 6-3. Uh, and, uh, and I just don't understand how someone who claims to be a conservative could vote for Hillary Clinton, encourage others to do so, and plan to vote uh, dem the Democratic line uh, in November. I I'd like for him to explain that to me, please, because I just don't get it. I'm happy to explain it, and I will be the first to admit that from a conservative perspective, Donald Trump has done a few things that conservatives applaud that a lot of other Republican presidents would have done, like appointing conservative Supreme Court justices. But to me, you have to weigh in the balance, and the, the bad, I think, far, far outweighs the good. Donald Trump is somebody who is assaulting the rule of law in America on a daily basis. He fired the FBI director to stop an investigation of his own campaign. He uh, daily denigrates the attorney general for not stopping that investigation. And with the help of Republicans on, on Capitol Hill, uh, he is trying to obstruct justice. I mean, that to me is a shocking abuse of power that no Republican or conservative who claims to believe in our Constitution can possibly applaud. There is also the fact that Donald Trump uh, is, is openly trafficking in, in, in racism and xenophobia and nativism. He is somebody uh, who has locked up children of, of undocumented immigrants. Uh, he is somebody who has used uh, crude terms to refer to African countries. Uh, he is somebody who is trafficked in, in anti-Muslim prejudice. Uh, he is somebody who, who divides America, who is erratic in his conduct, uh, who, you know, just look at what happened with Kavanaugh. Even if you think that Kavanaugh should have been, uh, you know, should have been confirmed, Look at, look at Donald Trump mocking Christine Blasey Ford for her story of, of being sexually assaulted, which uh, even Republicans did not doubt. I mean, this is so inhumane, so cruel. This is not the kind of conduct you expect from a president. And then he was claiming that George Soros was paying for the protesters who were protesting against George Kavanaugh, against, against uh, Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, you know, this is trafficking in this anti-Semitic uh, canard, which is also beloved by strongmen like uh, Victor Orban and Vladimir Putin. And by the way, Donald Trump has a, has a strange love of dictators. I mean, he said he is in love with Kim Jong-un, who is one of the most odious dictators on the planet. He has praised Vladimir Putin while running down our allies. So, you know, I think he is doing great damage to civil society at home. I think he is doing great damage to American standing in the world. Uh, we've never been more unpopular or less respected abroad. I mean, this is a president who was literally laughed at at the United Nations. So, I don't, again, I don't doubt that he's done a few good things, but I think the negative far outweighs the good, and it goes beyond policy disagreements. I think he is debasing the presidency, and I think he is uh, assaulting the rule of law. He's threatening our democracy, and he's hurting our country. 
Max Boot is our guest here, conservative, author of the new book, The Corrosion of Conservatism and Why I Left the Right. Woody in Monroe, Michigan, a Democrat. Hi, Woody. Hi. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, hi, Max. Uh, I just uh, wonder if we could let the American people know that uh, Barack Obama created 4.9 million new jobs in his last two years in office. Keep hearing say, saying Reagan's getting all the credit for, I mean, uh, Trump's getting all the credit for creating 4 million jobs in the last two years, but that's down from what Barack Obama created in his last two years. So why is he uh, taking the credit for the economy when the economy's actually not doing any better than it was when uh, Obama was in office? In fact, it's doing a little bit less than what it was doing. Uh, I think everybody should know that come election time, don't you? I think that's Thanks. a great point, and, and it's kind of similar to the way that Donald Trump takes credit for his business success, even though we now know that he received over $400 million from his father. And, he, and you know, he was a terrible businessman who had multiple bankruptcies. He was bailed out by his family. But, of course, he takes credit for being this, uh, this successful self-made billionaire, which is, which is just flatly false. And in the same way, he takes credit for the economy, which is flatly false, as you point out. Uh, President Obama took office at the height of our, our worst recession in decades, the Great Recession of 2008-2009. He led the recovery and created a lot of jobs. Now Donald Trump has taken over. He was trashing the economy uh, during the campaign and then as soon as he takes office he says the economy is great. And, and there's no question that, that Trump and the Republicans have uh, added uh, uh, some, some, have turbocharged an already strong economy with a massive tax cut, but I think that's an irresponsible thing to do because what they're doing is piling up trillion dollar deficits as far as we can see to make a, a strong recovery slightly stronger, but the long term cost is going to be heavy. We're going to rack up huge, uh, huge, uh, countless billions of dollars in debt, uh, which is going to hurt our long term prospects. And that's something that Republicans used to be concerned about. Republicans used to claim they were in favor of fiscal responsibility and talked about the needing to balance the deficit, the balance the budget. They don't talk about that anymore because they are presiding over record-setting deficits after having attacked President Obama for his deficits, which I agree were problematic. They've actually vastly increased the deficits. So I think you need to cut through a lot of, of President Trump's rhetoric, which bears very little relation to reality. Max, but the previous caller said you sound like you despise the president. Are you personally offended by this president? If so, tell us why. I am personally offended, and I'm and and you know not only am I offended, I'm offended that there are people who are not offended who don't mind what he has to say. I mean, again, uh, what's most offensive to me is uh, is not the fact that he is sympathetic to isolationism and protectionism, not even the fact that he is undermining and, and bad-mouthing American allies like the, like the Prime Minister of Canada. All, all of that is offensive to me. But what really offends me is the way that he traffics in, in prejudice and bigotry, the way, for example, he has uh, used the, the issue of African-American NFL players kneeling during the playing of the anthem to protest police brutality, and he's basically used that to bash those those Af those rich African American athletes to the, to, to the delight of, of of much of his base, uh, you know the way that he constantly ref he refers to Latino immigrants as animals who are breeding and infesting in our cities. He locks up uh, uh, Latino children in cages. Uh, you know he referred to African countries as shitholes. This this is you know the most openly racist figure in American politics since George Wallace. But George Wallace did not become president. So to me this is deeply offensive. Uh, the way that Donald Trump is trafficking in, in the worst impulses in American life and elevating them uh, to, to, to the White House. I mean, he is somebody who has the bully pulpit and he's using it like a bully would. What is your opinion of the Vice President, Mike Pence, and his association with the President? You know, I think anybody who thought that Mike Pence was a principled conservative has to think otherwise because he has been an enabler of Donald Trump. He has given him some con quote unquote conservative cover. He has not disagreed with Trump as far as I know. He's really been a Trump sycophant. Uh, so I could not possibly imagine supporting uh, Mike Pence in the future. We'll go to John, Cleveland, Ohio, independent. Hi, John, you're next. As an immigrant, 83 years old, C-SPAN for 26 years, I never saw anything nice from the start because he debased the debates. He has no respect for the office of the presidency unlike anybody before him. And Republicans don't have any backbone. Even with the 3D printing, you can't make any backbone for them. 
And next thing is, if the conservatives, especially evangelists, who fight for the rights of the unborn, if they can watch the kids separated at the border in cages, I don't know what all this country is coming to. All that I can tell you is there's no maturity in the occupant of the White House. He's running his family business. That's what he used to do with the LLC with the names all over, like a Burger King franchise. That's not democracy. That's not capitalism. It's a cronyism. Max Booth. All, all I can say is I agree. Glenn, Lancaster, California, Republican. Good morning. I'd like to talk, talk about guilty until proven innocent. Donald President oh, are, Trump. Are you, are you going to denounce President Trump for saying law corrupt to, about Hillary Clinton and Senator Dianne Feinstein? Is, is that what you're talking about? Guilty until proven innocent? I'm, I'm talking about the Clinton Global Initiative, who you voted for, and George Soros, <laughs> if you really want to know the truth. I didn't vote for George Soros, my friend. How, well, you, you voted for Hillary Clinton. Yes, I how did, and I'm proud to have done so. That you, you were, how she threw him under the bus during a, an election, and this fake narrative about the Russian collusion. It's not a fake narrative, my friend. The U.S. intelligence community ha has proven that the Russians, in fact, interfered in our election. A lot more flexible out of Barack Obama's mouth after the election. Here, here's and Crimea happening right after that, and Uranium One, if you really want to talk about it. There was no Uranium scandal. That's entirely made up hoax by by Fox News and Donald Trump. Yep, the caller dropped off. We'll go to Greg, who's in Reston, Virginia, independent. Good morning, honor to talk to you. I really like how you contradict these false claims that people make uh, on the fly rather than letting them go unchallenged. The other comment I had was, uh, I like what you said, that I'm offended that more people aren't offended. Um, there's a saying that people are, that Trump is a symptom of a problem, not the cause of the problem. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on when this all started. Was it with Falwell and the religious right, or was it really with McCain and Palin? Thanks. I think it goes back farther than that. I write about this in my book, The Corrosion of Conservatism, where I trace some of these issues back to the very foundation of the modern conservative movement in the 1950s. And as part of writing this book, I went back and read uh, some of the foundational texts, like, for example, Phyllis Schlafly's book, and uh, A Choice, Not an Echo, which came out in the 1960s and was a huge bestseller. I mean, it is full of crazy conspiracy mongering about how there is this cabal of New York financiers who has taken control of the Republican Party and wants Russian world domination and is sabotaging the Republican Party. I mean, it's exactly the same kind of conspiratorial talk that Donald Trump traffics in. Or I even went back and read uh, Barry Goldwater's The Conscience of a Conservative, which is one of the most revered texts of the conservative movement. And it made me realize, you know, people said, accused Barry Goldwater of being an extremist. I never believed it, but looking at what he actually said, I, you have to agree, he was an extremist. He was somebody who opposed uh, the civil rights legislation in 1964, 1965. He didn't think that the government had any business desegregating uh, segregated schools. And he's also somebody who suggested that if there was another uh, revolt in Eastern Europe, like the one in Hungary in 1956, the U.S. Uh, should go in there militarily with nuclear weapons and make clear to the Russians that we were going to risk World War III to liberate the countries of Eastern Europe. And he, Barry Goldwater said we needed to overcome our craven fear of death. I mean, this really was extremism, and this is at the very foundation of the modern conservative movement. Now, this is, I don't think this defines entirely the modern conservative movement or the Republican Party, because we've also had an awful lot of uh, leaders who are very moderate, especially once in office. When you think of President George H.W. Bush or candidates like John McCain and Mitt Romney, very moderate, very sensible people. But there has always been this dark underside of conservatism. And unfortunately, what's happened uh, in, in the last few years, even before Trump, but certainly with Trump, that dark underside has become the dominant part of the Republican Party. That's become the governing dogma of the Republican Party. The way I put it is that the Republican Party used to be a conservative party with a white nationalist fringe, and now it's a white nationalist party with a conservative fringe. Let's go to San Diego. Jason's watching there on our line for Democrats. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I would like, to, I have two comments, and maybe you can give me some insight on it. Now, just recently, well, prior to that, Donald Trump is always talking about the media is the enemy, the enemy, the enemy. Right. Just recently, a Washington Post 
journalist went back, I guess, Saudi Arabia with his wife to get some papers, and they murdered him. They murdered him and cut him up in little pieces. I would think that they they feel it's okay because of the way they're reading Trump. And also, the other comment I'd like you to mention is that Fox News is talking about mob rule, mob rule. I hear Trump say mob rule. Then all these Republicans talking about mob rule. But when those Nazis were walking through Charlottesville and they murdered this girl. Yeah, uh, I think they the, call it like good people. They yeah. call it good people. Right. Yeah, I mean, I can, sir, I can see why you're upset, and I think you have every right to be upset. I mean, this this mob rule thing is a, is a canard. I mean, there is some, there are some unci uncivil protesters on the progressive side, and I don't agree with you know chasing government officials out of restaurants and so forth. I think that's a mistake. But this is not mob rule, and, and then the mob was clearly. You know, the white supremacists in, in Charlottesville, where Donald Trump said there are good people on both sides. And frankly, the mob is also at a lot of these Trump rallies where, you know, on the one hand, Trump is denouncing so-called mob rule. On the other hand, he's leading his crowd uh, or, or he's inciting his crowd into chance of lock her up, first about Hillary Clinton and now about Senator Dianne Feinstein. If that's not mob rule, I don't know what is. And to your other point about uh, the, the, horrible, the horrible disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi, who was a contributor to the Washington Post, where, where I'm, I'm also a columnist. He disappeared at the Saudi consulate, consulate in Istanbul, has not been heard from since, and, and there are credible reports that he was in fact murdered by the Saudis. And this is a shocking crime uh, where we must bring this to light and we must punish the offenders and we must make Saudi Arabia pay a price for this if in fact they did this. And we have every right to be concerned that Saudi Arabia may have been incited to do this or may have thought they could get away with it because of the kind of hateful uh, rhetoric from Donald Trump who talks about the media as the enemy of the people, which is the way that dictators have spoken. And Donald Trump has also been, you know, uh, just basically given a blank check to the Saudis. He's backed them in everything, including a lot of very questionable decisions they've made in the past. And so you can imagine how uh, MBS, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the effective ruler in Saudi Arabia, might have thought he could get away with kidnapping or even murdering a journalist who writes for an American newspaper because he thought that you know, uh, that uh, that President Trump and Crown Prince Jared Kushner wouldn't care much about what happened to this to this reporter. And, you know, I think it's imperative for Congress to disabuse con uh, Saudi Arabia of that impression and make clear that there will be a price to pay uh, for this shocking crime. How, how should Congress respond? There are sanctions that can and should be imposed under the Global Magnitsky Act. Uh, any individual found to be involved in this should certainly face sanctions, and that includes uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And I think we also need to look at our overall relationship with Saudi Arabia and ask, should we be giving them all these weapons? Should we be supporting the Saudi war in Yemen, which I think maybe we should now pull our support? We need to make it clear that this is not acceptable behavior. Shane Harris has the story for the front page of the Washington Post. The headline, Intercept, shows Saudi plan to lure the journalist. The Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia ordered an operation to lure Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi back to Saudi Arabia from his home in Virginia and then detain him, according to the U.S. intelligence intercepts. The intelligence described by U.S. officials familiar with it is another piece of evidence impl implicating the Saudi regime in his disappearance. Yeah, I mean, this is just uh, so heinous and so shocking. I mean, to uh, to uh, kill a, a journalist in, in your consulate in a NATO country. I mean, this is, you know, the kind of behavior we might expect from America's enemies. But to see it from one of our friends uh, is, is truly unconscionable. Lonnie, who's in Red Springs, North Carolina, a Republican. Lonnie, good morning. You're on the air. Question or comment? All right, I have to move on. Let's go to Tim, who's in Michigan, an independent. Hi, Tim. Hi, Greta. How are you? Honey? Morning. Mr. Boots, sir, welcome to the resistance. You are a true American patriot. <laughs> Thank you. I wish you would join Malcolm Nance on the Stephanie Miller show on uh, Free Speech TV. You and I'm a I'm a Bernie Sanders socialist. I contributed close to 900 bucks between t-shirts, things like that. You're more of an American than I am. I'm going to tell I you I wouldn't that go that right. far. I appreciate it, but I wouldn't go that far. I'm, I'm not a better American than anybody else. 
Well, no. As far as I'm concerned, you're a better man than I, Gunga Din. But I just want to tell you a little story about my Uncle Frank. He was in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. All right. Well, he's, he's a better American than either one of us, then, I would say. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. They were under heavy mortar fire and heavy machine gun fire. Half of his unit made it across this river. And my Uncle Frank swam like an Olympic bowling ball, but he was the least cut up. The other half of his unit was still getting hammered. He had to ford that river carrying a rope across the, you know, river. So that current, and he couldn't swim worth a lick. He got that rope out over to the other side and got help get those guys back. He got a bronze star and a purple heart. And when I would ask him about, you know, what he did in the war and did he get any medals, and you know what he would say? Oh, yeah, I got the purple heart. I, I cut my finger on KP de, uh, detail with a potato peeler. And now if, you were to, if he were alive today, and those people, I, I can't even call them that, in Charlottesville, if I would have asked him, and if I would have said, hey, Uncle Frank, do you think any of those tor uh, torch-carrying Nazis were fine people? I think you know the answer to that. And I just want to thank you, sir. Thank you for joining the resistance. Well, thanks for those kind words, and thanks for the for that tale of your uh, of his of his World War II heroism. I mean, that is truly stirring, and that's somebody who truly was a great American. Margaret Snacks, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Democrat. Good morning. Hi, Margaret. Uh, yes, I want to thank Mr. Boot for his common sense, and I think I'll buy his book. And my question has to do with churches. Uh, it seems to me from here in the Bible Belt that our churches uh, have been kidnapped by the, the extreme right-wingers, uh, some of them with lots of money. And uh, the church, I feel like the churches are being used. Could you comment on your knowledge of what's happening to our churches? And thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I think that is a good point to raise. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly striking to me to see that Donald Trump's strongest support is among white evangelicals. And you would have to ask yourself, why would church-going people who believe in the Bible support somebody like Donald Trump, who paid off a playboy playmate and a porn star with whom he had affairs, who uh, has been horrible in his conduct towards women, who abuses the weak all the time, who's a bully, uh, braggart, uh, who uh, lies incessantly, uh, who cheats. Uh, you know, Donald Trump does not exactly exemplify what I would think of as being uh, the Christian virtues. Uh, you know, and I remember when evangelicals were so offended by Bill Clinton's behavior, and rightly so. I mean, I was offended by Bill Clinton's behavior, too. And, you know, in the late 1990s, uh, evangelicals uh, and, and and uh, uh, conservatives who, who represented the, the, uh, uh, the quote-unquote uh, moral majority wing of the party were talking about uh, the importance of character in office and how, how Bill Clinton was debasing the office. And I agreed with that. But if Bill Clinton was debasing the office, Donald Trump is debasing the office 100 times more. And evangelicals have nothing to say about that. They're fine with his egregious, uh, immoral conduct. And, and that's that's just, uh, to me, dismaying because essentially what they're doing is they're putting their narrow political goals. They want a justice on the Supreme Court. They want this, that, or the other. They're putting it above the larger issues of right and wrong, and, and they are turning a blind eye to what I believe is some very egregious misconduct in the Oval Office. And that's something that has offended you know, some of my uh, evangelical friends, uh, people like uh, Pete Weiner and, and Mike Gerson, who have spoken out about this. Uh, and it's, it's just a tragedy that, uh, that so many people who, uh, you know, profess to uphold what's right uh, are, are backing a president who doesn't care about right or wrong. Nancy's in uh, Big Bear City, California, a Republican. Hi, Nancy. You're on the air with Max Boot. Hi. Um, I think that Mr. Boot's remarks are 
just the typical Democratic propaganda that they've been putting out there. I'm not a Democrat, though, um, am I? Well, you're on their side. Uh, only temporarily, because they're standing up to Donald Trump and standing up against his abuse of power. Well, Obama abused power, too, passing DACA. And passing DACA was not an abuse of power. That was voted what? in as by far Congress. As separating, can you be quiet? As far as separating I'm just trying to fact check parents. some of your statements, which are not accurate. You can fact check it after she okay. finishes her point. Sure. Go ahead, Nancy. Finish your point. In 2016, 20,939 American children were separated from their parents that uh, committed crimes. And also, the you want Elizabeth Warren in there when after illegal immigrants killed an American uh, who said, "Well, they, you know that's too bad, but now we have to think about really important things about separating children." The hispandering of the uh, illegal immigrants and the billions of dollars that they cost American taxpayers every year is just not right. Okay, we'll take those points, Nancy. All right. Well, I I don't agree with much of, of what the caller is saying. I don't think it's accurate. Uh, you know, she's suggesting that somehow the Obama administration was separating children in the way that, that, that Trump has done. That's simply not, not true uh, because, you know, these, these immigrant children are being separated from their parents who at worst, uh, you know, perhaps committed a misdemeanor, which is being in the U.S. illegally is a misdemeanor offense. That is not a crime for which you should be separated from your children and have your children undergo trauma of being locked up in these cages and, and taken away from their parents. That's a ter That's something that if it happened in another country would be a human rights abuse. And you know, there are certainly some crimes committed by illegal immigrants, but the way that Donald Trump has harped on this is completely uh, uh, misleading and out of proportion. And it's basically catering to native sentiment because if you actually look at, at the data, at the facts, which is something Trump does not do, immigrants, whether legal or illegal, are actually more law-abiding than the native-born population. There is not this rampant epidemic of crime by illegal immigrants. This is a figment of the imagination of Donald Trump and Fox News. Yes, there are some crimes committed by illegal immigrants, but there are far more crimes committed by native-born Americans. And there are many minority Americans who are the victims of crime themselves, and those crimes are never featured on Fox News, never talked about by Donald Trump. He only focuses on a handful of high-profile crimes committed by undocumented immigrants, and that's part of his campaign to demonize all immigrants, legal or illegal, to reduce not only illegal immigration, he also wants to reduce legal immigration, and that to me is anathema to everything that I believe and stand for. I mean, I'm an, I'm an immigrant myself. I mean, if it were up to Donald Trump, I probably wouldn't be in this country. My family wouldn't be here, and millions of other Americans wouldn't be here either. I mean, heck, he probably wouldn't have let in his own grandparents into America because they don't meet the test that he wants to meet for, uh, for, for today's immigrants. Betty's next. High Point, North Carolina, Democrat. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Mr. Booth, I just last night picked up Witness by Whitaker Chambers and Great began book. to read it Great once book. again. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I'm reading the preface by um, Robert Novak, mm -hmm. and he uh, added a article written by um, Miss Rebecca West back in 1952, and I'm looking at lines in here that are saying what's happening to us as far as this administration is concerned, that she's writing about in 52, which talks about um, about uh, contempt for national institutions, insecurities. And this was something that uh, was going on with that uh, Communist Party back in the 30s and 40s. So I just, would, you know, I, it just amazes me because it's, just seems like that it's just that we finally got they finally have been able to catch up with what they've been trying to achieve for probably a hundred years max but well witness by whitaker chambers is a great book and i write about that in my own book the corrosion of conservatism because witness was one of those books that influenced me as a young person and part of the reason why i became a conservative whitaker chambers was a was a time magazine editor who had been previously 
uh, a communist and an agent of the Soviet Union, had broken with the Communist Party because he understood ultimately that, that it was an evil institution, it, was, it's, it, 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 it promoted repugnant crimes, and that was a very painful thing for him to do, but he, he broke with, with the Communist Party and, 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 and feared for his life, but spoke out and, and spoke out for freedom and, and democracy and, and, and liberal institutions, and he saw the United States as, as the force that would counter uh, this communist evil, and that, that spoke very powerfully to me because my own family came from, from the Soviet Union, from a communist country, and you know, this is one of, witnessed by Whitaker Chambers, is one of the foundational texts of American conservatism, uh, which, and, and one of the basic ideas is fighting for freedom, and it's, it's just sad and shocking to me to see that Donald Trump has no interest in fighting for freedom. In fact, he praises dictators and doesn't talk about human rights. Uh, that is not uh, what conservatism should be about, in my opinion. Wade in South Carolina, independent. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I I just wanted to say if uh, this guy thinks we don't have mob rule going on in the country, what about during the inauguration and they were destro destroying property and busting windows in Washington and uh, destroying property and setting fires at the colleges because we, they didn't want a conservative speaker. And just this week in the news, chasing a guy through an intersection beating on his car, hollering racial slings because he's white. I mean, if that ain't a mob, what is? Well, how about if you want a mob, why don't you look at what happened in Charlottesville in August of 2017 where you had these tiki torch carrying neo-Nazis, one of whom drove his car into a crowd of people and killed a young woman. That's a mob. I don't hear Donald Trump denouncing that. I, what I heard him saying was that there are good people on both sides. Uh, there, I didn't see any mob rule during the Trump inauguration. There were some, there were large peaceful protests, and there were probably a few incidents of violence. That's the kind of thing that happens often at, in, 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 in political events. But I mean, if you want examples of violence, why don't you look at some of these Trump rallies uh, where Donald Trump was inciting attacks on anti-Trump protesters? He was actually applauding it and saying, you know, when people were removed, that they ought to be removed on a stretcher. Uh, so, you know, if anybody is inciting mob rule, it's Donald Trump. And, 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 and to be clear, I don't agree with all the tactics that progressive activists practice. I mean, as I said before, I don't think it's right to chase government officials out of restaurants and harass them with their families. I think that's uncivil, counterproductive, not the way we should conduct ourselves. But Donald Trump has no standing to complain about mob rule when he engages in it more than anybody else. Tim in Fairfield, Connecticut, Democrat. Hey, how you doing? Um, just a comment on the Saudi Arabia journalist killed. Um, I think it needs to be a unilateral condemnation. Like if, like I'm just I'm just rewinding back to like Max Spears or um, even Julian Assange. If we're gonna celebrate journalism, we need to celebrate journalism from across the board. We can't just pick and choose right now who we celebrate. So I think. Okay. Oops. Sorry, Tim. I cut you off too soon. Didn't mean to do that. But Max Boot, his point. Well, I don't know what the connection is to Julian Assange because he's not a journalist. He is somebody who has been used by Russian intelligence as a conduit for information warfare. Uh, so that's an entirely separate issue. But I agree that there should be condemnation of Saudi Arabia if, in fact, they murdered Jamal Khashoggi, which the evidence seems to indicate that they did. Max Boot, our, the, the author of, the, of the, his new book, The Corrosion of Conservatism, Why I Left the Right, there it is on your screen. He's also a senior fellow for the Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you for the conversation this morning. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. I enjoyed it. That does it for today's show. We're now going to bring you up to the Senate Judiciary Committee. They're, consi they're considering a couple of bills, one dealing with foreign interference in U.S. elections and lynching, as well as nine judicial nominations. This includes Jonathan Cobes, who is nominated to be sit on the Eighth Circuit Court. According to some reports, an American Bar Association committee has given him a not qualified rating. It's the sixth such rating for one of President Trump's judicial nominees. Live coverage here on C-SPAN.